Okay, folks, so I've got a few problems here that I would like to make sure you know how to do for the final. And so this is the problems that you'll see in Canvas application problems practice. Number one, of course, you can read this. Avocados contain 21 grams of fat per 146 grams of avocado. How much fat in grams will 200 grams of avocado contain? So the first thing I need you to know is this is called a proportion problem. And so you've worked with some of these before. And we know that 21 grams of just avocado goes with, um, it, it, that's not just avocado, my bad, of fat. Okay, so it's 21 grams of fat. And then you have 146 grams of avocado. Okay, and then how much fat in grams, so we don't know how much fat in grams is associated with 200 grams of avocado. Okay, so that's the question. Now, you can set this up again as a proportion, and really a proportion is just a ratio equal to another ratio. In other words, a fraction equal to another fraction. And what you can do is you can make a fraction out of this information, and then make another fraction out of this information, and then just solve. Okay, so the first fraction, let's put fat on top. Do you have to put fat on top? No, what you have to do is be consistent though. So if I put 21 grams of fat in the numerator, so I have fat in the numerator compared to just avocado in the denominator, so that goes with 146 grams of avocado. So again, keep in mind, fat's in the numerator, avocado's in the denominator. So set it equal to the next ratio. So fat goes in the numerator. Well, that's what we're looking for, right? So I'm going to call that X. And then avocado goes in the denominator, so over 200 grams. Now, how do you solve a problem like this? Well, the easiest way to do it in this problem, again, is called a proportion. It's a ratio. So 21 out of 146 is a ratio. And then X out of 200 is a ratio. And if you have a ratio equal to another ratio, that's called a proportion. And to solve a proportion, you cross multiply. So I'm going to say 21 times 200. Okay. And what goes in the middle of this cross multiply multiplication is an equals and we multiply 146 times x and then of course you go to your calculator so 21 times 200 is 4 4200 is equal to 146x and then to solve I divide each side by 146 and that's going to be, and it should be, the amount of fat in 200 grams of avocado. So, four, have I done this? No. 4,200 divided by 146 gives me 28. So, I have X is equal to 28.76712329. This is what my calculator tells me. Now, notice this problem says right up here, round to the nearest tenth. So the question is, what is in the tenths place? Well, there is a seven in the tenths place, correct? So you always look directly to the right. If that number is five or larger, you would round the seven up to an eight. If this digit directly to the right, we could care less about all that. If this digit directly to the right is below five, Okay, then you would keep it a 7. So our final answer is going to be 28.8 grams of fat. Now careful, you should always check out the directions. Direction might want you to put the units there, which would be grams. The directions might want you to write a sentence, 28.8 grams of fat and 200 grams of avocado. Or it might just want the number. Okay, so just always go back and read your directions, but 28.8 grams of fat when we solve this proportion. So that's an example of our proportion problem. Let's see what else might show up on the final. Next, we have a work problem. Now, this is a problem that you more than likely have not done 
in um, possibly in your Math 100 class. Uh, future classes, we will have work in a, a section about work, but um, if you're one of my earlier Math 100 classes, um, you haven't covered work in any of your homework sections, and that's because it shows up in Student Learning Outcomes which is what this is, but it did not show up in the list of material that we were to cover. So I have to add it in at the end, and I apologize if you haven't already learned anything about work. But what I'm going to definitely do here is streamline the process for you. I'm not going to go into a deep explanation of why and how you do these problems, but I'm going to go into a general type of formula that will get you through this. So I'm going to give you what you need, basically. And so what I mean by work problems, I mean like people doing a job. And what happens when you read these problems? And let's read the example first, and then I'll get back into what I'm saying. So Chris can mow her lawn by herself in 150 minutes. But Chris and Ted together, with two lawnmowers, of course, can mow the same lawn in 65 minutes. That makes sense, right? One person by themselves is going to take longer than two people, do, two people doing the job together. But the question is, how long would it take Ted by himself to mow the lawn okay so again I'm gonna give you the quick not the long explanation of why this works but let me show you what works so the way to set up this is you do one over the time alone plus one over the time alone okay that's gonna give you one over together. Now what in the world am I saying? <laughs> These are individual people time alone. So in this particular case it would be 1 over the time for Chris plus 1 over the time for Ted is equal to 1 over the time for Chris and Ted. And then you just solve that equation. Okay so here we go. 1 over, do we know the time for Chris? Yes. Chris can do this in 150 minutes. So I have 1 over 150 plus 1 over the time for Ted. Well, that's what we're looking for, right? We don't know the time for Ted, so we need a variable. How about we call it T to represent time, or Ted, whichever one you want. So that'd be 1 over T, okay? equals we do have the Chris and Ted time together right a hundred no 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 65 minutes so that would be 1 over 65 and this is the equation we need to solve now how would you solve an equation like this now that you have learned you might not remember how to do it but you have learned this and to solve this is called a rational equation what you want to do is multiply by the least common denominator. Least common denominator of what? Every fraction. So I'm going to look at 150, t, and 65 and multiply all these fractions for by the least common denominator for the denominators 150, t, and 65. So what's a number that both 150 and 65 divide into? You can find the least common denominator or you could just save yourself a minute or two. You're just working with bigger numbers, but you have a calculator. Just multiply 65 times 150. It'll get you there, right? It might not be the least common denominator, but it would be a common denominator. So, hey, let's just do it. Save some time. So, what is 65 times T times 150? Well, 65 times 150 is 9,750. Don't forget the T. So what do I do? I multiply 9,750 times 1 over 150 plus 9,000, oh, T, don't forget the T here. I'm telling you, don't forget it, and I almost did. 9,750T times 1 over T, and that equals to 9,750T times 1 over 65. So you see what I did there? Multiply 9,750T the least the common denom a common denominator uh, times each of those fractions why did I do that so I could simplify and I don't have any fractions in my problem anymore it's called clearing fractions okay so how many times does a hundred fifty divide into nine thousand seven hundred fifty T 
65 times, right? Because that's how we got 9,750 in the first place. All right, so I have 65T plus, now this T and this T cancel each other out, 9,750 equals, and 65 goes into 9,750 how many times? Well, 150 times, right? So it would be 150 uh, T. Now, how you, this is a linear equation. How do I get the T's by itself? Well, how about we sub subtract 65T from both sides? Then I'm going to go to the top right of the page over here. So I've got 9,750. 150 minus 65 gives me 85T. And last step, let's divide each side by 85. So you've got 9,750 divided by 85 and I get a final answer of T is equal to 114.7058824 but now notice it says round to the nearest minute now what's in the minutes well there's a four right that means I only look directly to the right I could care less about all of that but since that value is above, five or above, right, then we round up. So my final answer is T is equal to 115 minutes. Okay, what, what did we just find out? We found out that it would take Ted 115 minutes to cut the yard. Whereas Chris by herself, it takes 150 minutes, but we, we know that if they do it together, it takes 65. So depending on the information you're given, sometimes you're given how long it takes each of them individually to cut the grass, right, or, or do a particular job. And then you would do one over that time plus one over that time, and you're missing the together time. You could just call that T also, okay? So hopefully that, that helps. I know that's not a deep explanation of what work problems are and the theory behind it uh, for future classes I will have that available but we just need to get through the this final question and it's a required question for for all of our math 100 students to take okay so let's move on to the next type of question all right so here we've got Olive can run five miles uphill in the same amount of time it takes her to run seven miles easy on flat land okay and that makes sense that she could run on flat land and get farther in the same amount of time that she could run uphill. So she can run on flat land four miles per hour faster than she can run uphill. How fast can she run uphill? Now these are called uniform motion problems. And you have covered these. It may very well have not been your favorite type of problem, but we do have to do one of these on the final, okay? And again, it's what we call a student learning outcome. So I have to report these um, that you know how to do them. So I do want to prepare you for this. So what do we need for this problem? Well, we need a formula. We're talking about miles, which is distance. We're talking about four miles per hour faster than some other amount that's a rate how fast can she run uphill again that that's a rate uh, what else time is part of this does that ring a bell well we got a formula distance equals rate times time okay so that's the formula in your arsenal that we need to use but we have two different situations going on here we have an uphill situation and we have a flat land situation I'm just gonna put uphill and flat right now let's just write everything we know for uphill the distance D is five miles so that's the first thing right in the same amount of time now that's pretty important let's 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 write that somewhere that the time is the same we're going to need that. That's very important. So the same amount of time it takes for her to run seven miles on flat land. That's our distance on flat land. So D equals seven on flat land. We also know, okay, so right there we're using that. We also know she can run on flat land four miles per hour faster than she can run uphill. But that, we don't know how fast she can run uphill, right? But we know that on flat land it's four miles per hour faster. So that's a rate that we're talking about. But here's the deal. 
okay? I can't say rate is 4 on flat land because it's 4 miles per hour faster than uphill, but we don't know how fast she's going uphill. So here's what we're going to do. For uphill, we're just going to call rate R because we don't know what it is. For flat land, we're going to call rate R plus 4. Why? Because we know it's 4 miles per hour faster than this R right here. So far, you with me? Lastly, we know the time's the same. Anytime you know that one of the values is the same, then that's, that's what you're going to set equal to each other, and we need to solve for t. So since the time is the same, that tells me I need to solve my equation for t. So I'm going to take distance equals rate times time and get the t by itself. How do I do that? I divide this side by r, and I divide this side by r. So that gives me on the left d over r, and of course that gives me just t on the right. So instead of using distance equals rate times time, I'm going to use time is equal to distance over rate. Okay, so back here to our uphill situation, distance over rate, okay, is 5 over r. For our flatland situation, distance over rate is 7 over r plus 4. Now what do we say? The times are the same. So I set these things equal to each other. So I have 5 over r is equal to 7 over r plus 4. Now this is a proportion. So what do you do with a proportion? You cross multiply. So I'm going to multiply 5 times r plus 4. Parentheses required. And then an equals goes in between. I'm going to multiply r times 7. It's better written as 7r. Almost done. Then we just distribute. So I have 5r plus 20 is equal to 7r. And then I'm going to subtract 5r from both sides of the equation which gives me 20 is equal to 2r, and finally, divide both sides by 2, so 10 is equal to my rate. Now, remember, the rate represented the r for uphill, so this is uphill, and Olive can run uphill at 10. This is a rate, so that's going to be miles per hour, but notice it didn't ask for uphill. Uh, oh, yeah, it did. How fast can she run uphill? The question, you know, we answered the question, how fast can she run uphill? It is 10 miles per hour. But real quick, just in case, what if they asked for flat land instead? So that would be the R plus 4 calculation. So she can run 14 miles per hour on flat land. But again, always read the question. It could just as easily as asked for flat land as uphill. We got the easy one that was uphill. Okay, hope that helps. We have covered that before. If that really stumped you, you might want to go back and watch some of those videos or do some of that homework. But I can tell you the one on the final is very, very, very similar to this one. Next, problem number four, you have done a problem like this before. So we've got figures A and B are similar triangles, okay? Similar triangles means that these triangles are in proportion. They have the same exact angles, okay it's just one is a smaller triangle than the other so that means the sides are in proportion Now notice we're looking for side x over here which corresponds to side 17 over here okay and you've got to have two bits of information that match so what you do is you can set up a proportion and there's many ways you can do this where this side you know, corresponds to this side, and you could say, for instance, 8 over 21, because those are in the same position, equals, now notice the small triangle is on top, so the small triangle over here would also be on top, x over 17. Now, you don't have to do it that same way. You could even say x over 8, another way to do it. Watch this. I'm going to do this in a different color, x over 8, and all this is the small triangle, equals 17 over 21. They, they both work. So I, I know students get really confused. How do I know which way to do it? There's actually a bunch of ways you can do this. Um, but let's cross multiply, and you're going to see why there's a bunch of ways. So if I do it the first way, I have 8 times 17 equals 21 times x. Well, look, if I do it the next way, I got x times 21, which is 21x, equals 8 times 17, okay? You got the same problem. I'm going to work on the one on the left. So the first thing I'm going to do is multiply 8 by 17, because I need to know what that value is. 
and I get 136. So now I have 21x is equal to 136. What's my next step? Divide by 21, right? And so I get x is equal to 136 divided by 21, and that gives me an answer of 6.476190. 476 at least that's what my calculator tells me now it says look at the problem this is when I always go back and look at the problem it says round to the nearest hundredth matter of fact it might say doesn't say anything about rounding at all what would you do well you just leave it like this 136 over 21 that may reduce it may not okay um, if 7 divides into both of them it will reduce because 3 doesn't divide into both of them but um, it says to round, so that makes our lives easier, into the nearest hundredth. Wait a minute. What's in the hundredths place? That seven right there is in the hundredths place. Remember, so I look directly to the right. I could care less about all of this information. If that number is five or bigger, I have to round that seven up to an eight. Had it been smaller than five, then I would keep that a seven. But it is bigger, so this is going to be 6.48. 8. 6.48 what well there's no units given at all in this picture could have been inches it could be miles it could be centimeters it could be anything we don't know we don't care because we weren't given that our answer is 6.48 and that's it next problem variation problems I don't know if you've seen these guys before so I don't have the problem here for you I want to talk just a bit about variation problems there are two types there's direct variation and then there's inverse variation you think indirect would be the right word for it and it could be called that sometimes but inverse is really what it's called now for direct variation think multiply for inverse variation think divide there's theory that goes into this as well uh, direct variation you think about a situation where if you increase one value it increases the other value so for example you work a job the more hours you work the more you get paid okay so that's an example of a direct variation story an inverse variation they relate the opposite way so if one thing goes up the other thing goes down so back to that job the more hours you work the less time you have for your family that those are inversely related now most problems tell you whether you have a direct situation or inverse situation so you don't have to get too hung up in that direct here's what your original setup is you're going to have a variable varies directly so you're always going to have a k it's called the constant of variation direct means multiply that looks like an x i should have just put a dot for multiplication you multiply times your other variable so this is the formula for direct variation on the other hand inverse variation you still have a variable you still have your constant of variation but instead of multiplying we divide so we divide by x and sometimes the variables get squared or cubed or it's square roots it'll tell you that in the problem okay so remember direct y equals kx inverse y equals k over x now let's apply that to an actual problem so our first example here the weight of an object on earth varies directly okay so there it is I promised you it would be there there it is varies directly to the weight of the same object on the moon so it tells you a 200 pound astronaut would weigh 32 pounds on the moon how much would a 50 pound dog weigh on the moon now that excuse me that can be overwhelming if you read all that at one time let's just do one thing at a time let's come up with an equation and then we'll start doing something with these numbers so step one I'll give you some steps here you're going to come up with an equation all right step two we're going to solve for K it's going to be easy enough and then step three calculate requested result <laughs> all right we'll see what we can do with this okay step one come up with the equation we got this now there, i don't see any x's and y's here so and you don't have to use x and y i would use letters 
that relate to your problem so it's not so confusing. It says the weight of an object on Earth, that's one of our things, varies directly to the weight of the object on the moon. How about we call the weight of the object on Earth E, okay, and the weight of the object on the moon M. Now, where's the constant of variation go? Well, probably the space right here I left, right? Remember, there's a K that goes there. We don't know what K is. We've got to find it. All right, so here we go. So the Earth varies directly to the moon, weight of objects anyway. So then you use the next bit of information to solve for K. I can't solve for K right here. Well, I could just divide both sides by M. You get E over M equals K. But just plug in your value. So it says a 200-pound astronaut. Now, that's earth weight right so i'm going to plug that in for earth 200 is equal we don't know k remember that's what we're trying to find now m what's m would weigh 32 pounds on the moon there we go now we solve for k so i'm in step two now i'm going to divide both sides by 32 and then i get k is equal to 200 divided by 32 i know it doesn't go in there evenly Hopefully it's a nice decimal. If it's not, I need to leave it as a fraction. 6.25. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. So now we have a brand new equation. I probably could have snuck in here. Step 2, solve for K and rewrite your equation. Okay. So my brand new equation in blue is going to be E is equal to, now we know what K is, 6.25 times M. Okay. That's our new equation. If it asked for the equation, we'd stop right there. But then it gives this extra information down here. It says, how much would a 50-pound dog weigh on the moon? So what we do, the 50-pound dog, is that earth weight or moon weight? Well, it's earth weight, right? Because they want to know how much this dog would weigh on the moon. So I'm going to plug in 50 pounds for E, for earth weight. So I've got 50 equals k which is 6.25 no matter what m how are we going to solve for m oh you know what to do divide both sides by 6.25 and then 50 divided by 6.25 gives me 8 oh isn't that nice so m is equal to 8 now there's some units associated with this it's pounds right that dog would only weigh 8 pounds on the moon where he weighs, or she, weighs 50 pounds on Earth. I hope you don't find that difficult. It's just steps. So, equation, use the information they give you to find out what K is, rewrite your equation with K plugged in, and then plug in the value they want you to plug in so you can refine the, find the requested result. We get to try it again. The next problem is probably and inverse. Okay, so for a constant area, the length of a rectangle varies inversely as the width. So there we go, varies inversely as the width. Now what about variables? This is the length of a rectangle. I bet you would like to call that L. I sure would, okay. Varies inversely as its width. Let's call it W. Feels good, doesn't it? varies inversely remember what that meant it meant to divide so our equation to start with is l is equal to k k is never in the denominator by the way you always divide by the other variable over w so that's where we start now they're going to have to give us information for l and k a uh, w i'm sorry l and w to find k you're always looking for k in the beginning okay so length, let's see, keep reading. The length of a rectangle is 27 feet. So L is 27. We don't know K when the width is 10 feet. There we go. So now we're supposed to solve for K. How am I going to do that? I'm going to get the K by itself by multiplying both sides by 10. We know what 10 times 27 is. It's 270 equals K. So once you find K, you write your equation. My equation is L is equal to 270 over W. Where did I get that from? Right in the very beginning, and I plugged in the K value. So this is our equation, and if it asked for our equation, we'd stop right there. But this problem doesn't. It carries on and says, find the width of the rectangle with the same area if the length is 18 feet. Okay, so OK, 
Okay, length is 18, so I'm going to plug in 18 for my length equals 270 over W, and I've got to solve this equation for W. How am I going to do that? Well, listen, you cannot solve for a variable when it's in the denominator. At least I don't suggest it. What you need to do is get that variable out of the denominator by multiplying both sides by W. Why? Because these W's cancel, and now it's over here, and it's not living in the numerator anymore. I mean, in the denominator, it's in the numerator. So W times 18, everybody likes that as 18W equals 270. How am I going to get that W right here by himself? I'm going to divide both sides by 18. And that gives me W equals, and then I'll type in my calculator, 270 divided by 18, and I get an answer of 15. 15 what? 15 feet. I had to go back and look at my problem and notice every length or width was in feet. All of my measurements are in feet. Therefore, my width for this new rectangle is also in feet. Okay, so really you've got another proportion problem that you're dealing with here. That's really all we're dealing with. You could have just cross multiplied this as well, like back over here. When we were solving, I could have put that over 1 and cross multiply. Notice the work's the same. Um, but you have a constant of variation because they're not, it's not a direct proportion. What well, is a direct proportion? But it's not a basic proportion. It's got a constant of variation. Next problem. We're almost there, folks. Just, just problem 6 and 7 and we'll be finished. 6 and 7 are very closely related. You're not too far away from learning how to do this, so maybe these won't be too bad. Find two consecutive positive even numbers whose product is 360. Whoa, we got to break this down, right? What does consecutive mean? Back to back. Consecutive numbers are like 5 and 6, or 11 and 12, or 101 and 102. But then it goes on to say they need to be positive and they need to be even numbers. So instead of saying 5 and 6, if they're both even, it might be like 2 and 4, or 10 and 12, or 20 and 22. You see where I'm going with this? So consecutive even means they are back to back, but they're both even numbers. Now, we don't know what they are. You know what? That means we need to use a variable. So if I call my first one x, what's my next one? How about x plus 2? Because that's how you get from one even number to the next one, right? Like if you start at the even number 8, the next number is 10. How do you get there? You add 2. Or if you start at the even number 242, the next one's 244. How do you get there? You just add 2. So those are two consecutive even numbers. Positive, we'll deal with that at the end. That just means our answers can't be negative. So after we solve, we can't have any negative answers. Uh, it says um, the product is 360. What does product mean? I'm hoping you're telling me multiply is what that means. So I'm supposed to multiply these two numbers together? Sure. It's going to equal 360. So I say x times x plus 2 is equal to 360. Now, you may not recognize that, but that is a quadratic equation. How do I know that? And it's supposed to have an x squared in it? It does, right? x times x is x squared. x times 2 is 2x. What are we supposed to do to solve quadratic equations? Get it equal to 0. So I need to subtract 360 from both sides. I've got x squared plus 2x minus 360 equals 0. What's the next step? You got choices, possibly anyway. You can attempt to factor the problem. It actually will factor any of these consecutive, even, or odd problems will factor, okay? But now, if you don't like to factor, you could always use the quadratic formula. Nobody's stopping you. Quadratic formula with a equals 1, b equals 2, and c equals negative 360 will get you there as well. But now if you can see how this factors, you can go that route. I'm going to factor it. And if you play around with the numbers, you'll find out it factors that 360 is 18 times 20. And so since it's negative, one's got to be positive and one's negative. But the bare one 
has to be positive because that's positive. In other words, x plus 20 times x minus 18. You can take your time and figure that out. I do have a trick for you. If you know it only adds to be something small like 2, you can take the square root of 360, see what's close to it, and play around with those numbers first. Like, for example, the square root of 360 is 18.97 so I just tried 18 right off the bat and turns out 18 times 20 gives me 360 okay now I set x plus 20 equals 0 and I set x minus 18 equal to 0 I solve for x by subtracting 20 from both sides of this equation so it gives me x is negative 20 I add 18 and it gives me x is 18 now remember there's a big or between here these are not my two numbers either this gives me a solution and x is negative 20 what would x plus 2 be well if i add 2 to negative 20 it'd be negative 18 but now you know what that can't be the answer because it says positive numbers right so those are not going to work they make if i took out the word positive that would be a correct answer so, but we can't have a negative number, but this one will work. X equals 18 is the first number. If I add 2 to that, then I get 20. So there's my two numbers right there. Okay, not a bad problem. Here we go, our very last application problem for practice. Carolyn built a rectangular display case for her book collection. Um, I would draw a picture every time you have information that talks about any geometry definitely draw a picture so I drew a rectangle um, that's going to be a bookcase the height of the display case is eight inches less than twice the width of the base okay whoa right so first of all the height and the base let's label that you like calling this the base makes pretty good sense right and call this the height now it goes on to say again the height of the base Oh, no, wait, and the height of, that's really confusing. The height of the display is 8 inches less than twice the width of the base. So 8 inches less than twice this, okay? So this one is 8 inches less than twice this, okay? So first of all, what does 8 inches less than mean? 8 inches less than means subtract 8 so just scratch work down here I gotta subtract 8 what else subtract 8 from okay twice the width of the base now we don't know what the base is though right so maybe we should just call the base B because we don't know what it is and then twice that would be 2B check it again so if if I say call the base B the height of the display is 8 inches less than twice B. So that is 2B minus 8. Oh, we're good, right? Now it says the, oh gosh, the area of the back of the case is 2,880 square inches. What in the world? The area. How do you find area of a rectangle? A lot of you would tell me length times width. Well, in our picture, we're saying base times height, right? Is that different? No. It's exactly the same thing. That length and width length width base height it's just a matter of what you call it all right so now we know that that a is just substituting is 2880 so this is 2880 our base look at the picture we called it b our height we didn't call it h we called it 2b minus 8 so that's times 2b minus 8 notice the parentheses are required because that whole thing is the height We've got to multiply that whole height times base. So I have to use the distributive property here. So now my problem is 2,880 is equal to, I'm distributing 2B squared minus 8B. Again, B times 2B is 2B squared. B times negative 8 is negative 8B. What kind of equation do we have? Quadratic, right? How do I know? Because of the square. So quadratics, you got to get them equal to zero. So I want to move this guy over here. How do I do that? Just change the sign. He's positive on the left, make him negative when you move him over. That's no different than subtracting 2,880 from both sides of the equation. 
Hold on. There we go. Minus 2,880. Now, again, you could use the quadratic formula or you could attempt to factor it. I don't know if it factors or not. Let's find out. I do know there's a greatest common factor. Look, I can factor a 2 out of all that. So 2 comes out. That gives me b squared minus 4b minus 1,440. Now, if that would factor, multiplies to be negative 1,440, adds to be negative 4, we should factor it. Do you want to play around with those numbers? Listen, that's entirely up to you. I don't, I don't know if I do. Um, if you don't, then you could say, hey, right here, this is, my quad, this is my quadratic equation. I'm ignoring the 2 for now. A is equal to 1. B is equal to negative 4. C is equal to negative 1,440. And just plug that in. So plug in what? The quadratic formula, right? Instead of saying x equals, I'm going to say b equals, because that's my variable. And then it says negative b. Now this b and that b is not the same, right? It's not that b. This is the b from the quadratic formula. So, ne so hold on. I'm going to need to put a negative 4 in there. Erase that scribble. So negative 4 plus or minus the square root of negative 4 squared minus 4 times a is 1 times c is negative 1,440. And that's all divided by 2 times 1. So that gives me 4 plus or minus the square root of, that's negative 4 squared is positive 16. Now that'll always be positive. Plus, now I'm going to multiply 4 times 1, of course, is 4. And 4 times 1,440 gives me 5,760 over 2. I know you know how to do all this. You just finished doing a lot of this. 4 plus or minus the square root of. I need to add 16 to that 5,760. That's 5,776 over 2. Now my big question is, is that, is 5,776 a perfect square? In other words, is this a nice square root? So I'm going to type in the square root. I'm trouble typing it in. There we go. 5,776. And I get, oh, 76. That's lovely. So 4. You keep going. i got to fix this. Okay. So 4 plus or minus 76 over 2. Now I'm going to go to the top of the page here because I'm running out of space. So that's two separate answers. That's 4 minus 76 over 2 and 4 plus 76 over 2. Now y'all, 4 minus 76 over 2 is a negative number, right? Because that would be negative 72 over 2, which would be negative 36. Well, y'all, our B, remember that's a B value. That can't be negative. We're talking about a rectangle. So that answer is out. Let's do the plus one. That would be 80 over 2. 4 plus 76 is 80. 80 over 2 is 40. So here's what we found out. We found out that B is equal to 40. 40 what? Uh, inches. How do I know that? Because I went back and looked at the problem. It says that the area was 2,880 square inches. Because remember, area is inches squared. But we're just talking about the length, so it would be in inches. But what about height? How do I find height? Well, I have to plug it in this equation. be 2 times 40. I'm closing out my parentheses too fast. Minus 8. 40 minus 8 is 32, so it would be 2 times 32. And 2 times 32 is 64. Okay? So I didn't even draw my rectangle right. doesn't matter, though. The height is 64, and the base is just 40. Now, go back and read the problem. Make sure you're finding what they're asking for. Right here, I said find the height and the width of the case. So, again, the width or the base is 40 inches, and the height is 64 inches. And I should be accurate and write the word inches with the 64. Okay? I hope this helps. I know students are often very nervous about word problems. Listen, all the word problems on the test are right in front of you. Just the scenario has only changed just the tiniest bit. So please practice these. Go back over, maybe try the exact problems again. 
Um, and then you've, you've got it without me, you've got it. And you can do it on the test. Let me know if you have any questions. I hope you have a wonderful day.